out there and upstairs as well. And so I'll ask a few questions here and then we'll just open it up to all of you. You've just seen Laura Poitras's um, film. And with us on stage, we have Alan Rusbridger, editor-in-chief of The Guardian, commonly described as mild-mannered, as people point out, but now also described as outgoing because um, he, <laughs> he, he, um, he leaves in July to go lame, on to... Or lame duck. Well, no, to go on to other things. Um, Janine Gibson, editor-in-chief of Guardian.com, is one of the declared candidates who hopes to replace him in July. There may be other undeclared candidates on the platform or in the room. Who knows? Um, but she has declared. Stuart Miller, who hasn't, is head of news. And Ewan McCaskill, you will recognize, um, having just watched him on screen. Uh, Alan Rusbridger, in another film you may have seen, The Fifth Estate, was played by Peter Capaldi. And Oliver Stone is now making the fictional, or at least dramatic, version of this story. And Janine, you are being played by? I think I'm being played by Jody Richardson, which is, as you can already tell, like looking in a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you, and which, which of the great Scottish actors have they got to play you? <laughs> he hasn't got the Glasgow accent right, but it's Tom Wilkinson. <laughs> wow, well, that's, yeah. And um, Stuart, you, you're Sean Connery, no? <laughs> he was unavailable for tax purposes. So, yeah. <laughs> so who, who's playing you? Um, I'm not sure, but it might be somebody Welsh. So oh, right. Ah, oh. yeah. oh, we can probably guess one of yeah. those Welsh um, actors. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> the film goes up to um, the film goes up to a certain point, and obviously, I think anyone watching it um, wonders what happened next um, to some degree. So, first of all, you and did, did you get an encrypted Christmas card from Mr. Snowden this year? Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny enough, I do still speak to him. And um, I, I speak to him on encrypted chat. Uh, so we've got sort of, a sort of complex system of messaging, but it works pretty well. And uh, he, that's, he spends, although life in Russia, you would think it would be pretty severe, and he doesn't really want to be there. And his life's not that different. When he was in the States, he lived a sort of virtual existence. Uh, you know, online, talking to friends, and he does much the same. He sits up till early hours of the morning, and uh, you're talking to campaigners and sympathisers, and he watches everything. He, know, he, knew, he knows about Rifkin uh, uh, standing down and the IPT report, and he'll probably be watching this as well. I say, he could be watching now, yeah. And it appeared on the uh, film that it would be quite easy to work out where he is in Moscow, but is it? Um, myself and Alan went to Moscow last summer and uh, we met him in a hotel and there was elaborate uh, procedures for where we would meet him and it was in doubt until the last half hour. But we never discovered where he came from or where he went to after he left. And the film is, it, it has a thriller element but also it's biographically very strong because of the fascination of this character and why he did what he did, and you've also um, met Julian Assange, uh, who's in the same area. I'm just interested, because it's part of your job to assess people, and what, what did you make of him? Well, I think he's, um, he's very different from Julian Assange. He's, um, uh, he's, he's very measured. He, I mean, we, we had this, this, this question when we went there. We, we knew we would have about six and a half, seven hours with him, and, and you and I had a discussion to begin with, whether it would be better to have an hour of filming and, and five hours of discussion, or whether it would be better to film him for five hours and have a, an hour of sort of off-the-record chat at the end. And we went for the five hours of filming, which is quite, an, that would be quite an ordeal for anybody, I think, to, 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 um, uh, to, to speak for five hours, knowing that it was all gonna be filmed and used. And, and he's, he's just got this extraordinary control and intellect and ability to speak in, in sentences as though he's thought about. And I, I don't think there was anything that we asked him that he couldn't answer in, in almost perfectly formed sentences. Uh, and so he's a, he's a very different character from Assange, who, you know, who could, could be brilliant um, and could be um, unbrilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and for the fascination of that eight-day deposition, as Adam says, where he's so fluent. Now, did you, when you were working on this story here, yeah. did you have access to that? No we, no, we didn't. And in fact, the first time that we were, Janine and I were in New York, um, and until about 
two hours before Snowden was revealed to the world, we didn't know his name, we didn't know what he looked like, we didn't know what he sounded like, because we had to keep it all so under wraps. So there was, you know, when we saw the video that the world saw on that Sunday afternoon, there was a massive relief because, you know, he was so, as Alan says, very eloquent, spoke so fluidly, measured, you know, not a sort of wide-eyed, staring ideologue, and, and, and you know, and quite hot. So that was that was um, <laughs> that helps. Um, and I think I think the, the really striking thing for me when I saw the film was that, you know, the interview wasn't just a sort of, you know. Snowden at his best TV delivery. That's just how he talks. He, t you know, all his sentences are delivered like that. And there's just a sort of control and, a, and an understanding of the subject, which is just amazing. What, one of my favourite moments of yours in the film, I think the favourite, was where he um, puts the bag over his head in order to avoid visual capture by his laptop. And there's a little cutaway to you, and you have that moment that all journalists have sometimes with their sources thinking is this guy actually mad, and um, <laughs> can we trust him? But you must you were thinking that, weren't you, at that point? Um, yeah, I was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when uh, Snowden uh, was 29, when I saw him in Hong Kong, but, as you can see from the screen, he looks about 21. And he said that he'd worked for the NSA in uh, America, he'd worked for the CIA in Geneva, he said he'd worked for the NSA in uh, Japan, Hawaii, and uh, I found this sort of hard to believe, sort of looking at him. And then he threw into the conversation, and this is when I really panicked, that he'd trained with the Iraq, he, was, he wanted to go to Iraq, so he applied and joined the army and started training with the special forces. And uh, when he was training, he broke both his legs at this point, I thought, this guy is complete <laughs> Walter Mitty. <laughs> so it was against this background, trying to establish if he was real or not. He starts, he did a trick, I well, told Alan and others about, when he would leave his hotel room, which wasn't very often, he'd put a glass of water behind the door with a piece of, uh, a paper napkin with uh, soya sauce on it. So if someone came in when he was out, the water would spill you can't, couldn't undo the Sawyer mark. So all these things were going on. So when he, he reached the point where he pulls the red mantle over his head, well, that just... <laughs> sort of, cause I didn't, at the time, I didn't understand why he was doing it. Mm. Uh, and later, I think I asked him why he was doing it. And he said it was possible there was a camera hidden in the room and they would have seen him putting his uh, uh, pass, password into uh, his computer or somebody could be filming from outside the window, or uh, apparently just sort of listening to the chatter, you could pick up the uh, the keys. So, and all <clears throat> all the broken legs and everything do, does that, uh, as it were, stand up. It does. Yeah, that's the astonishing thing. Right. He did do all these things. Right. Yeah. Oh. And the thing that um, journalism students will obviously study for a long time is the ethical question, which is that. That amazing moment where he says, um, it's my intention, you pin a target to my back, you nail me to a cross, I know what's going to happen and I don't care. Mm. Now, this is really for the editors around the table. Um, do you still have to worry ethically, even if someone has said, I don't care what's going to happen to me? Alan? Well, Janine, Janine, you, you, you answer you, that first. Yeah. Well, I mean, the strange thing... Um, the strange thing about our relationship with the source was, was, was it was necessarily remote. You know, we, we, we saw the material because Glenn brought it to New York and, and showed us the sort of the sample material, if you like, which was um, the presentation that was the prism story and a few other documents. And it was on that basis that we sent uh, Glenn and Ewan and, and Laura to, um, to Hong Kong. But we never, as Stuart said, we didn't know who the source was. You know, at the point where we put them on a plane, we knew we wouldn't be able to talk to them, um, that every communication would have to be very coded or encrypted, and that you were basically sending them to verify the source, that the material was either the biggest security, national security leak in a generation, if ever, or a massive hoax that would make the Hitler Diaries sort of mm. slightly pale. And so you're putting an <laughs> awful lot of faith in Ewan McCaskill at that point. Um, thank God he was there. Um, and, and really, uh, the same was true of our relationship to the source. You know, for, for all the time that we were publishing 
the stories and analysing the material and you know, working with the lawyers and talking to the government, um, we were relying entirely on Ewan and Glenn to be talking to the source. And our, our, my duty of care to the source, I thought, came via them. So I was hearing, often via very convoluted encrypted chat, I mean, it looks quite good on the screen. It looks really fast and, oh, you say something and they type back and you're having a conversation. It's not like that at all. The connection drops. Um, uh, Glenn talks on chat in what can only be described as a fiery bark of monosyllabic <laughs> something. Same um, as real life. Yeah, well, sort of real life, yeah, apart from when he's got the dogs. But, um, but, but you don't sort of, so, so you're really, you know, it, it came back to us as he doesn't really want us to know what his plans are. He doesn't want us to feel responsible for him. He wants us to focus, I think there's a bit in the film where he talks about um, not wanting to make the decision about what to publish, that he, he has yeah. a sort of slightly idealised version of, of the media's role. And it, it makes you want to do the right thing by him and make good decisions. But what, what he didn't seem to want us to do was to be concerned about him, that he, he was always going to go public, that was always going to be the thing. And that, so it sort of, you know, you did all of that really, didn't you, with him? Did you worry about him, Ewan? Um, you felt very fatherly towards him. I did. Um, I've got three sons, so they were roughly uh, Stone's age. So I did feel that. I thought I felt for his father. I thought if that was me, I wouldn't like one of my own kids to be in that predicament because we all thought he was going to jail for life, mm. um, and uh, you know that was the likeliest outcome. We, we the one regret I have about Hong Kong is. Uh, you know, for a while afterwards, I thought we didn't look after him well enough. And I discussed with both Janine and Alan uh, at the time, before he went into hiding, um, what can we do for him? Uh, and we discussed paying his hotel bills, maybe uh, legal bills. And uh, then in Hong Kong, we thought uh, he was going to fight extradition in Hong Kong. And I left Hong Kong and thought, that's it. And uh, when WikiLeaks organized his flight to Latin America via Moscow, I thought at the time that WikiLeaks had made a major blunder and uh, it was a huge mistake. Uh, but now um, those sort of, that sense of guilt is gone because by accident or design, he's ended up in the one place in the world where he's safe. Um, if he'd ended up in Latin America, there'd have been the CIA hit squad in there and snatched them, or there'd have been pressure, diplomatic or economic pressure on Venezuela or Ecuador. Uh, Ch the Chinese didn't want them. They wouldn't, have, uh, they, didn't, they, were, they wouldn't have allowed them over the border from Hong Kong into China. So the one place in the world, by default, um, he's ended up where he's safe. I think the, I'm sorry, I think, yeah. I think the, the thing about Snowden was, all you can do with the source is be transparent and to sort of say, okay, by talking to us, here are the things that might happen and here are the things we might be able to do to protect you, but in this world, there's not an awful lot. And, and it's very rare you would ever get a source coming in who knows more about encryption, who knows more about the, the organisation that they're up against and who is better prepared than any journalist could ever be. Um, and, and, you know, you saw Glenn in the film saying to him, you know, you could go to prison for this. It's practically the first question you and asked him as well. And, and it was very clear from the start that that's what he was going to do because he knew how it would unfold from there. Alan, on that question, because I think Glenn was surprised. There was a five live interview. I don't know if anyone um, here heard that when his book came out, where I think he was surprised. The entire line of questioning from both the interviewer and people phoning up was, you have got the glory and this guy has lost his life, um, in effect. I mean, I think they said he was living in a dingy attic in Moscow. In fact, it looks rather mm. um, pleasant on the uh, film. But did, so did you, it is something that you, and the others have all answered, but it's mm. something you have mm. to worry about. Yeah, I think always with, with sources, you know, why, why, are, why are they doing it? How, how much have they thought through? What are the consequences going to be? Uh, are they good people, bad people? I mean, most sources are, are quite are operating out of quite questionable motives. <clears throat> um, but I, I think, I mean, it was Janine's decision to send Ewan and... and um, I mean, you can you can tell from Ewan's demeanour what, what the kind of guy he is. Um, when when we, when all this was happening in America, we were giving a lot of TV interviews, and the the only way I could describe him in shorthand was to 
refer to him as Scottish Presbyterian, which he, <laughs> he slightly objects to because it's a long time since you've thought of yourself as a Scottish Presbyterian. But 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 um, he's 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 you know one of the most straight, unimpressible, experienced all-round reporters in the Guardian. So having him as your proxy in the room. Uh, uh, taking these decisions was incredibly important. I think if we hadn't had Ewan in the room, no disrespect, no disrespect to Glenn or Laura, but we didn't really know them so well, uh, it might have been very different. And before we um, it open, open it up, I think there's one for you, Ewan, and your role as defense and intelligence correspondent. Um, I think most people who watch the film, they're astonished by the extent to which the American government and the British government go on defending these practices. So. What, um, because it seems indefensible to a lot of people, but h how do they justify it? Well, you, you've all heard the argument. Um, I mean, what's astonishing is I, I thought the NSA and GCHQ would be on the defensive, uh, but what's happened over the last six months is that they are actually asking for more powers. And the argument is if the more they know, they're a, they would be better able to stop another attack, and, or B, once an attack takes place, they'll be able to find the person faster. Um, I, mean, I think it's totally wrong-headed. I mean, I'm not anti-intelligence. I'm glad they're there. I'm, we need an intelligence service for tracking down terrorists or pedophiles or organized crime. And you need to keep some people under surveillance. Uh, the objection is to and the GCHQ hate this word, but the objection is to mass surveillance. And there are all the examples we've had from 9-11, Boston Massacre, Charlie Hebdo, uh, Jihad John, all these people were known to the security services. They could have had them under traditional surveillance. Uh, mass surveillance didn't contribute one iota to <laughs> any of those uh, cases. Um, so it, it's, the onus is on... The, all Snowden wanted was a debate, and that's what the motive of The Guardian was. So we don't sort of sleep, walk into a world um, where people are watched and the internet has given them these great tools. Uh, so all he wanted was that debate. So the onus, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, for GCHQ and NSA to e explain the benefits of what they call bulk data collection. And that, <clears throat> just before you find out what the audience thought, that scene where they smash the disc in the basement of the Guardian, <clears throat> do you keep a fragment of it as um, President Obama is supposed to have a fragment <laughs> of the helicopter from Obama? Brian Williams had another bit as well. Uh, we had, um, yeah, we've got a whole cardboard box uh, of fragments, mm. like pieces of the cross. <laughs> um, and the, the, the v &A has uh, got one. The British Museum uh, toyed with the idea of having one, um, but... Um, we should probably sell them put off as part of the Guardian membership scene. Mm. We could <laughs> <laughs> but they, uh, I've changed my view about them, because to, to begin with, it, I remember the, the mayor of Leipzig coming to see me. Um, there was this extraordinary reaction. I mean, the, the, the reaction in, in the UK was, was a bit muted, um, but there was an extraordinary reaction in, in, in America and in, in Europe, and especially in Germany, for reasons that I think we can all uh, imagine that the Germans take this very seriously. It's part of their, their, their recent past. So when the mayor of Leipzig came in and, and asked to see the smashed up hard disk, he immediately thought of burning books. He, he thought this was, a, was a, a terrible sort of iconic symbol. Um, and I, I thought of it that way for some time. But, but actually, as time's gone, I, I, I see it as a rather sort of optimistic thing that actually, although they came into, into this building and supervised our destruction of it, it had no effect whatsoever. You know, as, as I said to the cabinet secretary at the time <laughs> when he said this is what he wanted to do, I said, but it's already in America. You know, what do you think you're going to achieve? You know, um, Glenn's got a copy in Rio. I can see the symbolism, but, but, but what's it going to achieve? And actually, so to my mind, it now symbolizes the impossibility of, of, of repressive governments uh, suppressing the flow of information. So actually, I, I, I think it's rather an optimistic icon now. But were they going for the other symbolic power? I mean, was it a warning to others, the government? 
I mean, my, I mean I've, I've discussed it with people in government since and, and said with, with hindsight, what did you think you were hoping to achieve? And they say, well, with hindsight, it was a, it was a pointless thing to do. So I think they, they now realize it wasn't the smartest thing in the world to have done, because it, partly because it just made them look so bad. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, what a terrible I image of, of Britain as a cradle of free speech. Uh, I, I mean, I assume what was going on was that there were, you know, COBRA meetings or, or whatever the equivalent of the, the, uh, for the intelligence services, and, and they were, uh, I think there must have been some hawks who really wanted to come up and just close down the Guardian and, and, and string me up or send me to the tower or, or whatever, uh, and that this somehow bought them off. It, the, the, it sort of made life, and it did make life harder because, because um, uh, you know, we, we all had to decamp to, to, to America and, and, and the communications were, were, were hard. Everything about the story was very hard, logistically, ethically, legally. Brilliant. No, no, I was just gonna say, it didn't actually change the reality of publishing one jot. I think what it, what it revealed, I remember that conversation, where, I can remember the conversation where you were saying to them, but it's already in America. I can also remember a subsequent conversation where we were talking about publishing a story in partnership with the New York Times because we were sort of forced into partnership with the New York Times and were very grateful for their support once they were housing the documents, where they said to us, <clears throat> well, does it have to, I mean, do you have to publish it at the same time? And, and we said, well, yes. And they said, well, what if, you, what, if you publish, what if you let them publish it first, just by a bit? At which point you sort of thought, actually, the only thing the UK establishment is interested in is slightly offshoring the problem. If, if they didn't go, well, it wasn't, it wasn't really our, it wasn't on our watch. And, and then somebody actually said, um, if it's on the New York Times website, can you read that here? <laughs> and which, this is the fundamental sort of dichotomy of the story is that we're reading all these documents that show this enormous technological capacity, this sort of fearsome, sinister force that can take everything you do online. And at the same time, you've got somebody on the end of the phone going, can you, can you get that website here? How do, can you send me a link? And we'll probably find out from the audience, but it's quite hard to watch the film without becoming paranoid. So. Do you, do you do all that stuff every time you leave a room, you put a glass of water with um, yeah. soy I sauce on put the thing on, on my head. Yeah, <laughs> thing over your head. Yeah, on Skype. Only use a mobile phone time. once. Yeah, it did, it did make us very paranoid. The, um, the night we published the Verizon story, I had to, um, we published the story, and then I had to leave um, and come back to the office. And then the hour and a half I was out of the office, our entire block in um, Broadway in Soho had been dug up, and there was, they were laying new cables, <laughs> you know, I'm sure it was a coincidence. Which is exactly what um, Snowden says in the film, isn't yeah. it? That they're digging up. The no, it's extraordinary. You know, workmen yeah. have never moved so fast. It was literally an hour and a half. And, you know, I'm, it just makes you completely paranoid. We would get cabs, and the cab driver would say things like, you'd say, how much is that? And he says, mm, how much do you usually pay? We've been really educated to only have face-to-face -face conversations mm. that are really the only safe way to communicate was face to face. So I'd been talking to Glenn on um, crypto thing all night in Hong Kong, and we got in the cabin in the morning. We were sharing a cabin to the office. And I was going around. He said this and this and this happened. This happened. And then the guy turned around and said, and "How much do you usually pay for this fare?" <laughs> yeah. oh, we've which fallen. is the Brooklyn Bridge? Yeah. <laughs> which way do you normally go? Oh, we've fallen for the oldest one in the book already. <laughs> Tell them about when you got pulled off the plane. Um, so we went. Janine and I went to Rio after um, after Glenn. You didn't come back to London, Glenn came back to Rio, and we obviously Glenn couldn't come into the US um, with those laptops, so we went to um, meet him, and there was a very funny conversation with the Guardian's lawyers before we went, where we, Janine and I said, we're really worried about getting back into the US, and they said, it's getting out of the US you should be worrying about. <laughs> and, uh, but then we went to Rio, and uh, as we were there for sort of three or four days, and as we were getting back on the plane back to New York, we were walking down the, um, down the gate, and I was sort of taken aside into, into the extra security measures. Um, and Janine doesn't know what happened next because she was gone. She was never to be seen <laughs> again. Are you travelling with him? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, you know, and then they searched my bags and there was lots of stuff. And, you know, luckily it was all on Janine, so it was fine. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but thought, those I things thought, make I, you very paranoid. I thought, I've got, to get, I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. I've got the, I've got the stuff. I've got to get out of here. Um, 
and I'm sitting there waiting, waiting for Stuart, who's disappeared into the sort of cordoned off corridor that you only see in ET. I'm thinking he's never coming back. He's never coming back. He's gone for good. I've got, I've got to go anyway. What can I do? What can I do at this point? I thought, I know, I'll compose a really impassioned tweet. Because <laughs> 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 we had been publishing at this point, saying that the deputy editor of Cartoon US has been detained at Rio <laughs> Airport. Once, once we've left the runway <laughs> is when I'll do that. that I thought that would, that would probably see you right. You'd be fine. <laughs> You'd be fine. OK, we've got um, microphones downstairs and upstairs. Um, I can see upstairs, so we'll start down here. Who, who would like to start? Um, yes, a, a hand has gone up in the middle. A uh, black clad hand, I think, yeah. So if we have one there. And then if, so we can do as many as possible. If um, you, anyone wants to call for the other microphone, we can do that. Thanks. Hi. Um, great evening so far. Um, my question is about the release of this. Um, I heard it was, it was clearly not on public, not on general release. It's not in all the cinemas. It's not easy to find. Um, is it true that there have been heavy restrictions on getting this out? And the TV version of it, how edited was it? Well, the TV version is available for two more days on 4 on demand, and then it will go, after that, it will go, to, will it be permanently or not on 4AD? I, I don't think so. I think it's just there for right, seven days. Yeah, so it's there for two more days there, so you can get that. And is, is that different? Does anyone know the TV version? Um, yeah. Thank God. Have you got anyone from BritDoc? Are you from BritDoc? Hi, I'm Luke from BritDoc, the distributor. So, yeah, it's on, it is on 4 AD for two more days, and will be on iTunes in, in late April. It's not a different version. The version on 4D is the same as the theatrical one. Were, were there problems with the release? Was it a limited release? Uh, it wasn't so limited for a documentary. No, it, it's doing quite well, and it's still in the ICA cinema in London. OK, and uh, yes, if we could get the, we're just bringing down. I'm busy the stream, yeah, if you can wait till you get the microphone. Thanks. In terms of um, pre-publication, we, we, because we'd worked with the New York Times over the WikiLeaks the documents, we had sort of got into a frame of mind where we, where we were definitely going to go to the government in, in advance, and I think that was completely right. I, I think that's, that's less in the British mind than it is in the American mind for an obvious reason, which is to do with the law. So in, in America, it is virtually impossible since the Pentagon Papers case 1972 for, for the, the, the American government to seek any kind of injunction, whereas in Britain it's more or less guaranteed that they will try and stop you. So that, that makes it harder as a British journalist to interact with the government. But then nevertheless, th this material was so sensitive that we were always going to go to them. So we began publishing in America, and, and it began with Janine talking to uh, uh, every agency and acronym in, in the American Defense Department. I had a, uh, well, first, we, we, we put the story to them, just the Verizon court order, the, the one you saw, and um, uh, the, Dan Roberts from our DC office rang up and said, heads up, they've just rung the office asking who runs this operation and where are you? Um, <laughs> so you can imagine they were Googling. And then, uh, and then I got a call saying, are you available for a call you know, with the, um, the NSC representative from the White House? And actually, when the call came through, it was a sort of five-party, at least five-party conference call. And it was basically the sort of deputy director of the NSA, deputy director of the CIA, deputy director of the FBI, deputy director of the... Yeah, it was just kind of... There was five, it was like the joint chiefs had assembled. They're all called Bob. They're all called Bob. <laughs> and, uh, and they started off calling us you folks and lots of sort of charming things. We just wanted to check in with you folks and see what you're thinking about doing. And it ended up with some really quite haughty exchanges about the nature of journalism and who decides what should be published or who has the right understanding of, of, of 
uh, of national security to make a decision about where to publish a document. And um, I don't know, there was a lot of them, and then there was us. In, we didn't even have a proper speakerphone, so that was, that was slightly problematic. But um, I think they thought that we would do what most of the American press does, which is sort of, you know, um, go in for a nice chat in the Roosevelt Room and, and have a, you know, sort of civilised four-day conversation about it and then go talk to some other publishers. And, then, and, and of course, we were... We were saying, well, no, we're going the, to publish the, it in the, about five hours. The, the, but the form on this is is the New York Times in 2005 when they did the warrantless wiretapping story, or rather didn't do the warrantless wiretapping story. They, they sat on that for a year. So I think the, the American government felt confident that by talking to you, they might be able to talk you out of it. Um, in, in, in Britain, it, it, the, the pressure was pretty intense, uh, and uh, the, the pressure was reinforced by the knowledge on my, my assumption that at some point they would go for an injunction as, as they eventually said they would if we, did, we, we didn't uh, smash up the disks. Um, and that, that, that led to one compromise in order to get the first story out. The one thing they were terribly keen on was that we didn't mention the names of the telephone companies that were involved. That was, that was the thing they were most uh, alarmed by, and we didn't because I thought if, the, if that's the price we have to pay in order to get this story out, uh, we won't. I mean, the names have since come out in the, in the, in the German press, but, but, um, but so um, we, we didn't succumb in terms of not publishing, but, but that was the one thing. Was it right or not? I, I, I think I, I marginally regret not doing it, but if we hadn't agreed to do it, uh, they might have gone for the injunction with the consequence that we wouldn't have been able to publish at all. I was going to say, you have to assume as editors that if they go for an injunction, they will get it. I mean, there's no... Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I, there's um, I mean, some, sometimes people have a go at me and say, oh, you, you know, you were craven in, in smashing up the discs. Um, I mean, all, all that probably would have happened was, would, would, was that the, either the police would have been around here or lawyers with an injunction that, as far as we know, would have covered The Guardian everywhere. So it would have, it would have covered Janine in New York, it would have covered Glenn. So, it, I mean, Glenn, Glenn would have ignored, ignored that, he would have gone on publishing, the Washington Post would have gone on publishing, and we would have been caught in a two-year legal battle, costing us millions of pounds, unable to publish. <clears throat> so I couldn't think what, what principle would be involved in, in fighting a brave legal fight that you might be destined to lose and not publish uh, when you could just smash up the disks and go on publishing in America. There's another point as well yeah. about smashing up the disks, which, is, um, which was a very serious problem at the time, which you can't risk seizure of the disk. So you, you absolutely can't risk them coming in and seizing um, either uh, hardware or, or, or disks that, that we've been using or that any of our reporters or staff or our source um, have been uh, moving across borders because that's the main crime that they can charge people with is moving material around, and you don't, you just can't be sure what m metadata is contained within the equipment itself. Also, at that point, um, people didn't know what Snowden had taken. So we've talked about duty of care to the source. One of the main things we could do for our source was not expose him to further criticism over what he had leaked. And, you know, he trusted Ewan with a much larger number of documents from the GCHQ wiki than he had given, certainly at that stage, to Glenn and Laura. The, the, the material that, that had gone out in the first tranche was very carefully sorted. He'd really pre-sifted to make sure he was giving documents that related to the stories regarding mass surveillance. Um, whereas the stuff that he gave to Ewan, he gave because he trusted Ewan and consequently the Guardian to make good decisions about what to publish in the national interest, to, to hit that balance between not damaging or revealing secrets, but telling the story. And what we didn't want was um, people coming in and being able to launch a greater case either against him or against our journalists by, from what they could find out from the desk. But also on the national interest, there's that very significant moment, I think, in the film where he says, it's that exchange where he says... Um, Britain is leading the, the field in this stuff at GCHQ, which does clearly redefine the... I mean, it, it clearly gives a national interest defence here, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I was really surprised by it. Because uh, Glenn and Laura are Americans, they were mainly interested in the NSA. And it was towards the end of an uh, interview that lasted a couple of hours, 
And uh, I just threw in the question, you know, what, what about the UK? What about GCHQ? And uh, Snowden became really animated and uh, came out with that phrase saying GCHQ are worse than the NSA, which I was really surprised by. And I uh, asked him what evidence he had for that. And he says, um, come back tomorrow and I'll give you some. Uh, so I thought he'd give me maybe two documents. And I think, as you saw there, he gave me 60,000. <laughs> And the, sorry, you and just quickly, the gentleman's other question about, so what, what, give us a, a snapshot of the yeah. life of Snowden in Moscow. Um, a lot of uh, nonsense has been written about um, Snowden's life in Russia, that he's depressed, he's an alcoholic, uh, he doesn't drink. Um, hasn't seen daylight for two hasn't years. Hasn't seen People daylight say, yeah. for two years. Yeah. His girlfriend's left him. Uh, well, none of it's true. You know, as you saw there, Lindsay Mills is in the... Uh, Moscow, she sometimes goes back to the States, but she uh, goes to see him in Moscow as well. And the Citizen Four, that was the first time that uh, it was revealed that she was in the States. Um, I spoke to, if you'll just indulge me for a minute, uh, I spoke to Snowden uh, just recently, and I told him I was coming to this event and asked him uh, if he wanted to send a message. There's only two paragraphs, and I'm crap at reading things out, but I'll read it anyway. Um, the, I, I said, this, the people coming to this event are Guardian readers, so you could address it to Guardian readers. Um, but what he's done is, it sounds like a press release for the Guardian. <laughs> uh, but, uh, is, it, is it encrypted? Yeah. Or not? <laughs> no, no. It's all ones and zeros. <laughs> I, I, I've decrypted it. Uh, free societies depend on an adversarial press one that understands its core mission is to expose abuses of authority. Without the remarkable work of brave and talented journalists, including those at The Guardian, we would today still be ignorant of the reality of mass surveillance and the threat it poses to our democracies. Citizen Four is a film about the fourth estate, and I hope we never forget that whether you're a newsreader or a newsmaker, Every free society is founded on the willingness of its citizens to speak truth to power, even in the face of great risks. Do you want that for your editorship, then? Yeah, It'd be I quite useful. Picture you could just, yeah, I, I'd, I'd just um, <laughs> use that. We'll just uh, take more questions in a minute. But just one thing that struck me, Janine, was in the film, the, how bad it was the general, wasn't it? The second person appearing before the Senate. What mm. a bad liar he was. He does every possible tell <laughs> for lying, if you've read. It's astonishing. He dared look them in the eye, and then yeah. he tries to cover up his face. I was surprised by quite how nervous he was. Yeah, I suppose they don't want to be dragged into the light, do they? And they, 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 the NSA had survived with an extraordinary little scrutiny for a very long time. They just they weren't talked about, and when they were talked about, they were talked about in wholly reverent terms. So, so extreme was the reverence for the NSA, especially after 9/11, which you can understand. Um, that a, a, a feature was done in Wired magazine. Um, looking around their new offices, which are roughly the size of a state. They take the massive, massive complex. And you can see these pictures, they're still online. And it showed um, the control room, the information control room that they have, which has been built to replicate the control room of the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> I'm, that isn't a joke. He, he had the set designers in, he had the set designers in from Hollywood, and he said, build me the information dominance room. It's going to look like the Starship Enterprise, and I will have the captain's chair in the middle of it. And so that when the senators and the congressmen and everybody comes around to talk about funding, I'll say, would you like to sit in the captain's chair in the information dominance room? And it'll be like being on the Starship Enterprise. And I mean, we were all laughing because we're a bit British, but that works, you know, that works. They just, how much was their funding? Can you remember how much that budget was? Um, it's, uh, it's something extraordinary. I know it's, uh, no, I've forgotten. I know it's, uh, the defense budget is 50 billion, isn't it? And they take, uh, sorry, the intelligence budget is 50 billion, and they take, I think, uh, 40 billion of that. Yeah. 
Mostly for the Starship Enterprise. Mostly for the Starship mm. Enterprise, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll bring, take some all down from here. I just, um, because our eye line is out there, could I just see how many people there are upstairs who'd like to ask a question? You don't have to, but if, it's just I'm worried about leaving you out. If you, we're going to scan around there. Anyone want to upstairs? No? I don't think so, is there? Shout out if you do, but don't. Okay. We'll try again in a moment. But yes, um, two hands there if we can get microphones around to them. Thank you. Um, Janine, you spoke about sending Ewan on the plane and, and really not knowing what was going to meet him on the other side. And, and Ewan, you said even when you were in the hotel room and he was cloaking himself, you were sort of iffy on his legitimacy. So what, at what point did you realize this was something we were going to be talking about for a long time and, and was a big, a, a big deal? Shall I do the setup and you can do the reveal? So we had, we had planned a whole load of things that, you know, in as much as you can, there's, there's, there's no guidebook on how to establish your NSA sort. And, you know, we were sort of talking and going, how do you know if this is a genuine Pfizer court order? Because nobody nobody's ever seen such a thing. You can't sort of Google it and go, what do they look like? So we thought, OK, well, he must be end career because he's leaving the NSA with an enormous amount of access. And to have this level of access, he must be at the end of his career. So he must be sort of disenchanted. You know, we had a, a theory about how old he must be. We would honestly speculate about him. Is he sick? Is he feeling remorseful about what he's done? Um, none, in none of our scenarios was he 29 and... Uh, as Stuart says, quite hot. That wasn't, that wasn't, that wasn't a thing we figured out. But we, we had a number, so we were saying, you know, has he got a car park pass? Has he got a ver verification, you know, show us, show us some, what were the other things we came up with? I can't remember. But essentially it boiled down to, was the Guinness good, Ewan? It was, he had a code phrase, was the Guinness good? The, um, Janine used to go out on the road with me uh, during the election, and she get fed up with me taking her to Irish bars. So when... Before I left New York, she said, look, we'll need a, some sort of code. And uh, if Snowden's real, say the Guinness is good. <laughs> and if, In memory uh, of all those crappy Irish people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can 100% be sure that someone's real. A lot of it's just instinct. He did show us. I, I said, I mean, how, prove who you are. And he threw open his suitcase and produced his social security number, his driving license, his CIA, uh, a CIA ID, and uh, a whole sheaf of documents, because he knew when he came to Hong Kong, he was going to have to prove who he was. And the documents seemed real. Um, but I don't think we were sure. I mean, Alan, Janine, and Stuart are going to be appalled by this, but I don't think we knew till we approached the White House and they said, oh, yes. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't trust you that much. <laughs> you, don't, you don't stop at just asking the source, well, you know, are you real, mm. yes or no? Um, yeah. And you look at the documents and I remember you saying, you know, nobody could produce that number and that variety of documents in, in a hoax. But the point where I think we, we sort of knew is when we went to, um, we put this first story to Verizon and uh, we knew that if it was real, then they wouldn't be allowed to say anything. And if they come back and said, no, that's, that's, uh, that's not right, then we should take them at their word. And they, we put the call in, and they said, OK, we'll call you right back. And about three seconds later, the phone rang again, and we picked up the phone, and they said, can you just give us the date on that order? Which one is it? Is it, is it, <laughs> is it yellow or is it blue? OK, yeah, OK, we'll be back with you. And then they came back very quickly and said, we can't comment on that. And then there was the conversation with all the bobs, where it was, you know, it was, <laughs> it was very obviously real. And at that point, you know, you just know that it's real. Because your question, you're, basically, what you're thinking, you're obviously, the first question when you're sending is, is the source real? Absolutely. But even then, that's not going to be enough. It's, you know, the source could be a real person and still have some mad vengeance or something. Um, but in the end, all you're really coming down to is, is it true and is it in the public interest? So you, uh, sitting back in the office in New York, not in the hotel room with the, uh, all the excitement of soy sauce, you are just basically really focusing with what is your public interest case? What is your justification? What do you publish and what do you redact? And we had amazing help on that from lawyers. But in the end, just you know, some of the finest editorial brains from here who came out and, uh, and, and uh, real experts in the subject. And then, you know, is it true? As, as Stuart said, you just narrow it down. And there are always clues. And the moment when the guy was going, 
which agency is it? <laughs> And what are the dates? But the, um, think, the other yeah, thing is, just, sorry, just back on the, the point about you know, the British pressure, <coughs> no sooner had we put the phone down on the bobs than we had a phone call from um, Paul Johnson, who's a deputy editor, deputy editor here in London, saying the MI5 had already been on the phone to London, saying that the New York office were in danger of getting the Guardian into a bit of trouble, and um, could we have ourselves think about what we were doing? And when those, when those wheels start to turn, you just know it's going to be There's also destroyed. another area, though, that um, you mentioned the Hitler Diaries earlier, Janine. Robert Harris, in his book on the Hitler Diaries, writes about the risk for journalists is that you want to believe it, right. and there even comes a point where you need to believe it yeah. because you're thinking, yeah. You just want the story. Yeah, I mean, you have to really be wary of that. Of that we're you? really, really aware of that. And you know, when you look, at that, this was the first first day we saw the material when Glenn brought it to the New York office. And our New York office is tiny. You know, we're a tiny little new subsidiary in a, in a loft in Soho, and we're sitting on a sort of you know not very auspicious grey sofa in a in a tiny room. Which, as I say, I don't we didn't even have a speakerphone. And um, we're all huddled up reading this stuff on a, an air gap computer, which basically means a brand new computer that's never been on the internet, that we'd sent you know, somebody to go and buy for the least possible amount of money in cash from Best Buy. <laughs> so this is, you know, this is not the high, this is not the Starship Enterprise. This is the opposite of that. And we're sitting there and looking at it. And if you've seen those slides, you know, you know even the PowerPoint looks like it's been created by a not very adept eight-year-old. <laughs> it's the sort of thing I would do. Oh, there's a triangle, and mm. that represents the internet. And, <laughs> <coughs> and you're sort of looking at going, well, I mean, it does appear to represent total domination of the internet, but not very <laughs> sophisticatedly. Mm. So I, there's not, it, it could all the time. So you are very, very aware right from the top that, that this this is not, you know, yeah. you, you, don't, you, you also, mustn't will it into being. You don't send you in if your aim is to believe the story. You right, he said you and if you really want to be Scottish yeah. Presbyterian. Exactly, yeah. 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 Ewan is the very definition of not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and Alan, in, in thrillers <laughs> such as State of Play, there's always a moment after the newspaper conference where one of the staff goes out and goes to the government or to the security services, unlikely probably at The Guardian, but did you, did you have to worry? I mean, was everyone on side always? About our own guy? Yeah. <clears throat> well, when the, when the cabinet secretary came into this building, um, he, I mean, I, I don't know if he was trying to spook us, but he, he, he wandered over to my window. My window is, looks out over the canal, and he looked at the, the, um, the housing over the road. There's a block of flats there. And he said, the Chinese will be in one of those flats. And then he said, and our guys will be in that flat over there. <laughs> and then when the GCHQ guys came in, uh, they said, why have you got a plastic cup on your table? I said, well, why shouldn't I have a plastic cup on my table? <laughs> and they said, because the Russians will be over there. And they will, <laughs> they, they, don't you know about how you can train a laser on a plastic cup and turn it into a microphone? Because a plastic cup <laughs> vibrates more than a glass cup. Yeah. And then the uh, cabinet the secretary plastic. said, you know, you will have ch Chinese spies certainly on the, on the, um, on the Guardian books. Um, well, if, if we have, we haven't discovered them yet, unless Ewan wants to come <laughs> and make a... <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know. We, I mean, who knows? I mean, does, I mean, we had we we had uh, we we ended up working in a room here with um, uh, security guards, 24 hours outside. Nobody could get into the room uh, without passing the security guards. Beyond the security guards, we had another member of staff before you could get into the room. So I think it would be it would have been pretty hard, and there was always somebody in the room. It would have been pretty hard for a Chinese spy to have nicked in unnoticed. Yeah, and in the New York office, you know, the, at the start of it, there was Janine and me who knew about it, and then Ewan was put on a plane. And then this was, you know, bear in mind, as Janine said, this is a tiny office with quite a young staff, and everybody knew something was going on, but there was, you know, it was kept very tight, and then these people parachuted in from London, and still nobody even thought to ask a question about it because they knew it was off limits. There was a very patient person here who was waiting for. Yes. Can we um, get the microphone around there? And then um, anyone further back? Yeah. There's somebody at the very back, if we could get the other microphone there. And then we'll go to the far corner. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I found it very surprising that, uh, so actually, I don't find it surprising that uh, the government kind of increased it. But at the same time, um, do you see some people in government, maybe in parliament, who actually are supportive of this cause? to have more privacy, uh, to, act, to ultimately change this policy. And what do you see as crucial for
for mass, uh, a crucial for uh, mass surveillance to actually change in five or ten years' time? Uh, what, what, what is the crucial point to maybe tilt the public opinion, or, or is it somebody who is in position of power and finally getting it that this is not the right way to do things? I, I, if, I mean, I've come to the conclusion that politicians find this subject almost impossible to talk about rationally. Uh, and you can, you can completely understand that. But you, but you, you talk to senior people on the, the Labour side and they are just paranoid about being seen to be weak on security. Uh, and, and so there are very few people on the Labour side who have said anything at all about this. They sometimes say things about uh, oversight, but not much, actually. Uh, the Lib Dems were in government, um, and most, most politicians just don't want to touch it. It's too, too risky and toxic. So this balancing act that we give them and ask them to make this, this, this balancing act on our behalf is not really being done by politics. I, I think the ISC it is not a sophisticated oversight body. I think the technology is not understood by most politicians. And so I think we have a real problem that, 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 that what Snowden has done is to raise an enormous spread of, there's not one public interest here, there are numerous public interests which he's laid out in front of us. And I, I, I really struggle to see how politics is going to get to grips with this on our behalf, which raises the question of, obviously of who outside politics can, 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 can help in this. But, but, uh, but politics, I mean, I, I think it's particularly true in this country. Uh, I think German politics has, has coped with it better in the sense of, of, of aerating it and, and American politics too. But I, th I think that's one of the big issues that we have to somehow negotiate after the next parliament because they will be back. Uh, I mean, I thought the, the way, as, as Ewan said, you know, all, all the cases, Boston, Sydney, Copenhagen, London, Paris, all these were about people who were already, were already on the radar. But within hours of Paris happening, uh, David Cameron was coming out and saying, we need the Snoopers charter back in order to look at everybody. And, and, and so the, 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 they are just, you can just see this, it's gonna be wave after wave of uh, attempts to get this through on, on the back of terrorist outrages uh, because that is gonna be the heightened atmosphere which will be more conducive to the arguments. And, and it's difficult to see where the civil liberties arguments are going to come from, so certainly not in mainstream politics. I think even in, even in the US, where there was a much, sort of, a much more vociferous debate and where Congress did, a, you know, there's the Fourth Amendment, which is against illegal search and seizure. And there was people on the Senate Intelligence Committee like Ron Wyden, who for years have, you know, have been trying to sort of signal that this stuff was going on but couldn't say it in public because of their um, position. And even though there was a bunch of senators and people in the House bought bills, even though eventually Obama came out and said, yes, we should end um, bulk, coll bulk collection of phone metadata, the, the sort of complex of the NSA, CIA, CIA intelligence community machine is so powerful and is so ingrained in American political culture that absolutely nothing has changed, even though most, a, a lot of Congress and the President has said it should change. Just last week, they reauthorized bulk surveillance for the fifth time running since we published the first story. So, I, I do think, though, I think there's one thing that might change the, the culture in the US. You know, Rand, Rand Paul was, you know, because it's a, it's a multi-party issue in the US, and the, it, it, the only people that would really come out publicly for bulk surveillance were really right in the heart of the um, administration. Um, and on either end of either party, there was a lot of voices against it. Rampel, who was one of the largest and most outspoken people against it, has started mentioning it as part of his campaign stand for um, the Republican uh, nomination. So, you know, I'm looking forward to endorsing him. <laughs> um, <laughs> if it, uh, sorry, Ewan, yeah. Just one small point. I mean, it's not all gloom, uh, apart from <laughs> Rand Paul. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I think as a result of uh, Snowden and the debate, you know, people are more conscious uh, of, the, of surveillance than they once were. And but the big change is in the, the big internet providers uh, like Google and others. Yeah. Because there's been such a consumer backlash against them, they're now automatically introducing encryption you know, just as you know, a, a norm. 
And the way you've seen the intelligence services in both uh, America and the UK, every time head of MI5 or MI6 or GCHQ makes a speech, they say, uh, Google and other companies have got to give us access to encryption. Um, so it's hurting them. Uh, and to me, that's one of the best things that can happen if it becomes normal that people use encryption. You, yeah, you asked what would change it. Consumer behavior will change it. Google got frightened when they thought their customers would, would walk with their feet. That was what changed. Mine's if it's good. worked out, there should be microphones in both back corners. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, there. I'm sorry, it's, it's kind of the same question. I was going to ask what your views are on how surveillance should be regulated. Um, but maybe to, to rephrase it, do, should, it, should the off online world be treated like the offline world insofar as you can only start surveilling people if you have a good reason to and if, if you, know, you acquire a warrant? And, and, and is it analogous in, in that sense or is there something very different about the online world that means the rules have to be different? I actually think you know that's not just a matter of, sort of civil liberties and privacy. I think it's a matter of the intelligence community being effective, mm -hmm. because the the you know the the euphemism that keeps getting used is they've got a giant haystack and all they keep doing is making the haystack bigger and nobody's looking for the needle and that's why they keep missing them. So I think I think what they should be doing is being more targeted. They should have better surveillance on people they know that there's reasonable cause to be concerned about, and they should spend less time just scooping up vast quantities of you know, communications records just on the off chance they're going to spot something in there. And then in, in the other corner, there should be someone there, yeah. Yes, um, it's, it's the same sort of subject, but uh, back in the 1980s, uh, Philip Knightley, the uh, author of Sherlock Holmes, he was the author wrote a very good book called The Second Oldest Profession, in which he analysed the incompetence and inefficiency and the disasters of the various intelligence services throughout the world. And the answer the intelligence services always produce from all over the world, whether it's the KGB or MI5, MI6 or the CIA, is always give us more resources and we will find the right answer. We won't mess up again. Which is exactly what has happened since the 1980s, way, way back, long before all this technology existed, long before the world of Snowden could have existed, they were increasing the budgets throughout the demo so-called democratic world. And that has continued to happen, I think, massively now. And isn't it a question of trying to limit the budgets of these people before they get out of control, rather like Macbeth's witches? I'm, I'm not, Just for Alan answers, could, could you get the microphone to the very back corner? Sure. That's someone been waiting a long time. Thanks, Alan. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know about the budgets, I'm, uh, but I'm not. I, I, I'm, I'm in favour of giving them the resources they need. So when, when you hear that in all the, all these cases recently, they actually knew the people. They were they were on the radar. They'd sometimes spoken to them, but they they were incapable of following them. So the, the, these were the needles. They had them. Uh, but they, 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 even when they had them, they couldn't do it. So th that may be an argument for, for more resources. I, I just think the, the argument for the haystack is the one that has to be made. And the, the question about the online versus the offline world, I think, is a really interesting one. Because offline, none of us would tolerate a world in which the police could come in without a warrant uh, and get the kind of information that they're getting. We would regard that as an absolutely fundamental infringement of, of hundreds of years of, of, of law. Um, and yet, somehow, we all agree to it. And, and somehow, I, I think m most of us just find this terribly hard to understand. It, um, th there have been two stories recently about the, the hardware, so the, 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 the fact that uh, weaknesses or backdoors were put in the, in the computers themselves. Or in the or in SIM cards, the, the SIM cards have been broken. Well, you know, who in the audience, given a choice between a computer that had been compromised by the state, or a phone that had been compromised by the state, you, you can buy this computer, which is going to send a copy of everything you do to the government for storage, or you can buy the one that isn't. It, is it, who's going to buy the one that, that that is compromised? So we can sort of understand it in in hardware terms, but somehow once it's up there in the cloud. Uh, it seems, or, or being being s s siphoned through a, through pipes that go through Cornwall, we find 
this very difficult to get a hold of. Um, but this, so I think this, this question about, about the resources, maybe they need more resources, but it ought to be, that, first of all, they have to, uh, to, to convince us why they need the big, the, the bigger the haystack when all the evidence recently is they can't actually act on the needles. But on that, though, because um, there's certainly a lot of people in politics say, and some people on other newspapers, that if they brought in kind of terrorist sus laws in which all these people on the radar were simply locked up or... Um, that newspapers led by The Guardian would be saying what an outrage that was and that that is a problem. Well, I, 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 I try to think of it more from the perspective of the person living their life who is subject every day to um, uh, dragnet collection and, you know, and, and, and a sort of level of assessment and what they, what they know about you. And I, think, I do think the offline parallel is really important. If you knew that somebody was just going to have a wander into your house, have a good rifle through your photo albums, <laughs> check, every, check your diary and your contacts book and just see what you've been doing for the last few days and, and have a good speculate about what you might have been doing with those people. And that within three hops, they call it, but you know, three branches of relation between everybody you know, that they could then if there was somebody that looked a bit ropey, then literally everything you do is subject to pouring over and question mark. I think people would feel completely differently about it. But I think because it's called metadata, or um, you know, uh, or, or sort of you know, there's a sense that um, some benign person in, in Gloucestershire is sort of looking at it and vaguely going, "Oh, no, they seem nice. We won't bother with them." And then it's just that's just not the reality of it. I, I think we would be absolutely outraged at the idea that we should all leave our front doors open and mm -hmm. any any member of the anybody who's just on their first training day at GCHQ can have a good rifle yeah. round. And all, and all the resources uh, arguments that they make are all, all about more powers, more money to do more bulk surveillance, but at the same time as they say, well, we can't possibly watch all these people because it takes, what is it, 30 to 50 people to have round-the-clock surveillance on somebody, and we, and we just can't afford that, so this is the kind of you know, cheap option, and the, you know, the truth is that is the much more effective option, and it would have stopped, or at least given them a better chance of stopping almost all the plots that have happened. The fact is, it's not for us to decide what is the right level, clearly, and I don't. I think we resisted trying to do that the whole time we were doing the story, because all our, all our job was to do was go, this is being done in your name to you, and, and you need to know that. We're moving towards the end of this, so if we take the one at the back, and then um, we can probably very quickly take those couple in the middle, yeah. Thank you. What's fascinating is that the quantity of data sort of bypasses the traditional argument that you might expect to hear, which is, you know, we couldn't possibly tell you why it is that we need to surveil these people because that's actually a matter of national security. So that's almost sort of put away half of the debate that I suppose lots of people are interested in. I myself am very interested in that. But I was wondering, you know, we've also not heard any sense of conspiracy or, or a whiff of it. And I wanted to ask, you know, with the 60,000 documents that Ewan was given, I mean, have you gone through those? Have you got the, 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 the desire to go through those? And, and do you suspect that there is an ulterior motive being billed as, well, we just couldn't possibly pay people to do this unless we just gathered everything on everybody? When you link your Royster card to your credit card, ha has there been a whiff of that, that's what I'm interested in. You, you read them. <laughs> the, of the, right at the outset, uh, Snowden said, Snowden is a patriot. I know a lot of Americans would find that hard to believe. Uh, including the president. <laughs> including the president. Uh, so when he came, he didn't want he said to us, and he said to Alan, that he only wanted published documents that had a constitutional element to them about this broad debate about privacy and surveillance. He didn't want documents published that dealt with operational matters, the sort of nitty gritty day to day, uh, you know, targeting of. Uh, suspected terrorists in Pakistan or Iraq and people listening in in Afghanistan. Uh, so there are a lot of documents as a journalist, uh, as a reporter, I would have quite liked to have done. But Snowden and Alan laid down this dictum that we would not report <coughs> operational matters. Because the Sand had been accused of putting people's lives at risk, hadn't he? Yep. But, yeah. Is he, uh, um, I've, got, I've never met Assange and I've got no beef with him and I'm grateful to him for bringing uh, WikiLeaks to the Guardian. 
So I try to resist comparisons with uh, Assange, but it is one of the major differences. Uh, Assange put the whole WikiLeaks uh, cash out into the public, and Snowden has totally resisted that. Um, the lady there, we're not going to get them. We'll try as many as we can. And I think, did the gentleman, somebody in front wanted? Yes, you start, and then we'll see where we go. Right. Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for showing the uh, movie. And um, first of all, do, does anyone know how you get a job with one of those surveillance companies? Because I think I could actually do with some surveying of my own, like a few numbers and stuff. Um, but uh, some joke aside, actually, my question is, if you are planning to do something that is not right, um, would you not encrypt your messages? Would you not actually do everything to hide yourself? I mean, you know, I, I, I send everything through openly, but probably so does everybody in this room, hopefully. Um, but if you are hiding things, you know, if you have something to hide, you know, you wouldn't do it openly. So the whole purpose of this surveillance, and um, I believe the the cost of actually con uh, containing all this information. Barack Obama says no, he's not. But um, journalists aren't supposed to have heroes, are they? You and Rudy. Um, he, he, someone said. Uh, you know, the last 18 months have been good for us. Uh, we've been awarded the Pulitzer Prize, you know, the first non-American publication ever to receive that. And Janine got an Emmy and... We all got an Emmy. We've all got an Emmy. Every one's Emmy's mine. <laughs> and we've received countless other awards. Laura got an Oscar last week for Citizen Four. Glenn Ritney's book. And uh, Snowden is in Russia. Although his life isn't uh, that bad, I mean, it's better than being in life imprisonment in a supermax prison in Colorado. Uh, it's not what he would have chosen. He'd much rather be in Western Europe. And he'd much rather be in America. So Snowden is the one that paid the huge price for this. Um, and he did it. He had a nice life. He, did, uh, uh, he was well paid living in Hawaii. Uh, prospects for promotion pretty good. And he gave it up because of a principle. He just felt that uh, um, we're walking into a world, living in a world where the balance between privacy and surveillance has shifted too far and that someone needed to bring it to public attention. Uh, so for me, uh, there's no doubt he's anything other than a hero. <clears throat> And when you meet Billy Richardson on set on the Oliver Stone, you can say, I've got an Emmy, because I don't think she has, has she? I don't think. <laughs> I don't so know. anyway, there you are. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yes, over there. <laughs> Sorry? Where to from here for everybody? Uh, so, well, we will, you know, we will keep reporting the documents. Uh, we will keep reporting the fallout from the documents. We're not going to leave this story alone. So I think that's stand by for more. And gentlemen, yeah. Um, I hope this is not too much of a general question to end on. Um, where I come from in Canada, our government is currently pushing through increased uh, surveillance powers for the spy agencies. And anybody who has actually cared to read about it has found it quite disquieting numerous lawyers, former prime ministers, so forth. But the problem is most people have not cared to inform themselves about it, despite the information so freely available. And as it ties into this story, this was obviously such a massive story when it broke, but I think it has faded from a lot of the national discourses. And so my question is, what, or is there more that you think journalists could do to drive public engagement? And perhaps more importantly, what can people, what can the public do to help drive that engagement with these issues that do not seem to be getting the attention that many feel they deserve? Well, I mean, I think we, I mean, we've touched on some of the things, you know, um, uh, use, use technology that encrypts your communications. Um, 
Uh, I know there's been an 80% take up in use of the Tor browser. The, you know, those, that's it's a small base, but that's that's a sort of significant thing. You know, you you have the ability to talk to your representatives and say, not I I don't feel happy about this. Most politicians won't come out and talk about it, but you have the ability to force them to talk about it. And when when the politicians come in here, we force them to talk about it. So there's about to be a, a general election campaign in the UK. You know, we have the ability to force them to talk about it, and and. People in Canada, I would hope, are similarly sort of very confused about this. Canadians seem quite right-minded. They should, you know, they should feel quite confused and conflicted. I think the, uh, the, the biggest blunder that's happened in, in recent months, and in, in, there's been such complacency about this uh, in, in this country. The most extraordinary sentence that sprung out um, was a piece that Max Hastings wrote in the, in the, in the Daily Mail recently. And I, I love Max, but on this issue, he uh, is very, very hostile to Snowden. And he wrote this sentence that said, I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine why all of us, uh, all our citizens, shouldn't surrender and be completely happy to have the government reading all our emails and all our phone calls. And you think, really, Max? You, you know, you've written histories of, of the Second World War, of Nazi Germany. You cannot imagine how, how this could... Uh, how this could be put to malign uses. Uh, but that complacency has been punctured because the police did this incredibly stupid thing, which was to use the RIPA legislation to get the telephone sources and the contacts uh, and the sources of journalists on the Mail on Sunday and the Sun. Uh, and I think that behavior by the police has woken up British journalists who are being incredibly complacent because if it's done to journalists, they feel it very personally as they should, uh, and you realize that actually the, 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 the Home Office has now come out and said, we will not recognize journalistic privilege, we won't recognize legal privilege, we won't recognize the, the, the relationship of confidentiality between a doctor and a patient, or a priest and, and uh, a communicant, uh, or a, a, even an MP and a constituent. So that's some, some pen pusher in the Home Office put this out saying, we in future will not recognize these customs and privileges and promises that we have granted people uh, because we now want to be able to surveil, surveil them without any say-so uh, of a judge. And I think the penny is beginning to drop uh, of the awesome powers that the state is taking upon themselves. Uh, and, and, and that's the thing that gives me hope. Good night, Randall. The thing we're going to just very briefly from you, and um, a trailer for the Oliver Stone movie. It is rumoured that the Oliver Stone movie includes an astonishing amount of sex. There's, um, <laughs> there's a scene where Tom Wilkinson says, I may be a Scottish Presbyterian, but... David, apparently there is, there is quite a lot of sex in it. <laughs> but it's not your character. It's not me. <laughs> well, you have to go and watch it to find out who does have all the sex in that film. But it's the answer to the question, what does he do in Moscow all day? Um, that, that, that is the um, answer. Anyway, thank you very much to Alan Rusbridger, Janine Gibson, uh, Ewan McCaskill, and Stuart Miller, and to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.